Good morning, family. Welcome to this morning service. As you can see, we're back out on field number two. It is a sunny day, lovely out here. I hope you're outside getting to enjoy it. Let's jump right into it. As usual, we pray for our nation's leadership. We pray for the leadership based upon an exhortation given to Timothy by the Apostle Paul under the leading of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Now I want you to pay close attention to the last part of verse two. He says he desires all men to be saved. All means all. <clears throat> whether they disagree or agree with your political bent, whether they are misogynistic, whether they are racist, the Lord desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. That is so important. So we pray for those who are inside the beltway, and I believe the beltway is that way, <clears throat> For those who are inside the beltway, who occupy those seats of authority, this is our edict from the Lord. It doesn't matter how they act. It doesn't matter what they do. Our job as the church is to pray for them. And this is how we pray. As you know, this is a nonpartisan prayer. We don't pr pray a blue agenda or a red agenda. We simply pray for the people that they come into the fullness of what Christ has for them. As so, as I said, you won't see any, any agenda in this. No red, no blue, no Republican, no Democrat, no blood or crypt. It is none of that. This is all for the glory of the name of the Lord that we do this. And the prayer is this, or first and foremost, this is who we pray for. We pray for the executive branch of our nation's government. The executive branch is headed by President Trump and Vice President Pence. The legislative branch here in Virginia, our two senators are Mark Warner and Timothy Kane, and the House of Representatives who covers our congregation are Mark, uh, Rob Whitman, Don Beyer, Jennifer Wexton, and Gerald Connolly. The senators who cover our congregation members in Maryland are Benjamin Cardin and Chris Van Hollen, and the House of Representative members who covers the congregation there are Anthony Brown and Jamie Raskin. Now we also pray for the Supreme Court. As you know, this is the only group who's appointed for life and in the history of our Republic, there's only been one Supreme Court justice to be impeached and removed from his seat. So that means these people are, are generally there for life. So we need to pray for them. First and foremost, the Chief Justice, John G. Roberts, and the Associate Justices, Kavanaugh, Ginsburg, Alita, Kagan, Thomas, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Gorsuch. Now we also pray for the governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general of our respective states. That would be Ralph Northam, Justin Fairfax, and Mark Herring. We also pray for the governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general of Maryland. That would be Larry Hogan, Boyd Rutherford, and Brian Froshen. This is how we pray. Father, we thank you for our current president, President Trump, and the other members of our government's leadership. We ask for divine wisdom and knowledge for them so that they may effectively minister to and govern your people. In Jesus' name and in his stead, we stand on earth while seated in heaven in him, speaking to the forces of Satan, looking to influence their decisions and cause trouble for them. And this is what we say, shut up and stop your movements. We pray that the president, Supreme Court, Congress, and other officials are filled with a personal and intimate knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Let them be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to you who has enabled all of us to share in the saints' inheritance and light. Enable them to stand mature and fully assured in everything that is your will for us. We pray that their love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of insight so that they will be able to determine what is best 
and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, and that Jesus will fill their lives with everything that your approval produces. Father, increase their love and their ability to know your love. We know and are fully assured in the knowledge that all authorities on earth are established unto you. By your power, fulfill every desire for goodness and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by us and then us by you. We pray that love will be the ground that we all sink our roots into and on which we have our foundation and that you will give us a gift from the wealth of your glory with inner strength and power through your spirit. <clears throat> and Father, we also pray for the surrounding geographic regions or districts which we inhabit here in Sully and which surround the Sully district, which is where the church is located. These districts are the Sully district. The black arrow points to where the church is located in the Sully district. The Drainsville district, the Hunter Mill district, the Braddock district, the Providence district, the Springfield district, the Dulles district, the Sterling District, the Broad Run District, and the Leesburg District. Now, when we pray for these districts, it is a righteous decree that the Lord gave us to make over these districts. And that righteous decree is this, awake to righteousness. And when we make that decree to the Sully districts and the districts that surround us, when we make that decree, we expect three things to happen. First and foremost, we expect prosperity to increase. Prosperity of both health and finance. We expect crime to decrease. You know, Satan is a thief and he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And as we speak against it, we expect his influence in these districts to be minimized. So crime decreases. And we expect an awakening, an overall awakening, to the things of God. And by God, we mean this. And I have to specify it because so many people call so many things God. We're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So to the districts, awake to righteousness. Hallelujah and amen. Okay, family. Let's jump right into today's message. We're going to talk about entering into our dad's kingdom or into our father's kingdom. You know, if you listened at all to the five minutes of encouragement, hopefully that, that was a huge motivation. And before I get started, let me just say, I, I hope everyone uh, has received the email about church next week. And so, as you know, the governor is expected to open up Northern Virginia to phase one. And as such, we'd be having church next Sunday morning, which is such a relief. Um, but I'm going to say this, even if he doesn't, we're still going to have church. So we're going to have church here, be it on the fields where we are now in the parking lot or best case scenario, of course, being the sanctuary. Now, there are also some CDC guidelines, which I haven't yet looked up, but I need to look up the CDC guidelines to see exactly what houses, of, uh, what the government is, is requesting the houses of worship do. And I want to make sure that we're compliant. But next week, we're definitely going to have church. And this message is all about entering our Father's kingdom. The five minutes of encouragement this week. It is so important that we have a revelation and an understanding of what that really means. What is entering into our Father's kingdom? Why do we need to enter into our Father's kingdom? <sighs> you know, last week, we learned that the kingdom of God is real, that it is here and now, and that there's only one way to get in. And that one way is through Jesus Christ. We don't need to rehash that portion of it. We're all, everyone who's watching here, I, it is the, the presumption have all been saved and, and quite frankly, mostly baptized in the Holy Spirit. So we're going to, we're going to make a few uh, assumptions that everybody knows what we're talking about. But if not, don't worry. Uh, we will have a prayer at the end to lead those who are not in the kingdom into the kingdom so that they can all enjoy these benefits that you and I have. 
But jumping right into our Father's kingdom is this. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no, by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. That is such an amazing statement. Now, let me say this. The, the scribes and the Pharisees, those people lived a, a, a very righteous lifestyle on the surface. And Jesus was saying, you know, it is almost impossible for you to do that. So what provision did God make? On the screen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for God made the one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. So family, as you can see there, God didn't leave us on our own. The righteousness that you and I were able to muster up on our own was as filthy rags in the sight of God our Father. So what did he do? He took his very own righteousness and transferred it to those who believe in Jesus Christ and who accept his sacrifice. And when you do that, as we mentioned in yesterday's five minutes of encouragement, when you do that, you become a new creation. You are as much a part of the kingdom of heaven as Jesus is. You remember the example that we gave of a citizen of the U.S. who has been naturalized citizen, they were born in a different country, but have gone through the process, they are as much a citizen of the United States as you are or I are. We are as much a citizen of the kingdom of heaven as Jesus is. And that's not blasphemy. To me, that is exactly the attitude he wants us to have. He wants us to rely so heavily on what he did. He wants each and every one to, to, to have such confidence in what he did, more confidence in what he did than in what the first Adam did. You know, prophetically throughout scripture, the Lord has been dropping little hints for us as to what our destiny is supposed to be. You and I were designed for his righteousness because he wanted to inhabit us and he couldn't inhabit it, an unworthy vessel. So he cleaned us up. But prophetically speaking, in the book of Genesis, we have a clear picture of what his whole goal was. Genesis 28, 17. Now this is actually Jacob. And he says, and it says, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So what Jacob was saying there is that the house of God is actually a gate of heaven. So let me ask you something. What is the house of God? Well, that's the place where he tabernacles. What is a gate? A gate is this. You know, I had the opportunity of going to college at a place that had a gate all the way around it. And the gate was where you passed through it and were subject to another reality. So on one side of that gate was one reality, and on another side of that gate was a, quite another reality. It was different than anything that I had ever experienced. But the gate was where the two realities met. And when I passed through one to the other, on one side of the gate, every meal was taken care of. All my needs were taken care of, my housing was taken care of, my safety and security was taken care of. There was armed security everywhere. Everything was taken care of. On the other side of that gate, it wasn't. Now, I still had rights to it because I was a midshipman and I was on active duty. But on one side of the gate, on the, on the inside of that gate, I had a certain set of rights and responsibilities. And on the other side, some of those rights and responsibilities went away. Now, Jacob said, this is the house of God. This is Bethel. That's what that, that word, that, this is Bethel. So whenever you see Bethel, Beth, house, El, God. Bethel, this is Bethel, the house of God. The gate of heaven. And so that gate is where the realities of heaven are supposed to pass through. You, family, are that gate. 
in the reality of our father's world of our father's reality is supposed to pass through you and go to the world that's our mission so we're talking about entering into the kingdom what is the kingdom well we learned last week last yesterday i think it was that the kingdom of god has nothing to do with eating and drinking has nothing to do with any rules or any commandments you try to live up to. But it was righteousness, peace, and joy in the realm called the Spirit. So we're going to talk this morning about the Spirit because at the end of this, I have a request for each and every member of the church that I need you to do next week to ensure that we are prepared to come together once again as a family. It is important that we realize that we practice, that we enter into the spirit, the realm of the spirit all the time. Now, the Apostle Paul gives us instruction in 1 Corinthians 14 about entering into that realm, practicing that realm. And I want to go over that with you right now because this has to do with what I'm going to ask everyone to do. 1 Corinthians 14.1, it is good that you are enthusiastic and passionate about spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. When someone speaks in tongues, no one understands a word he says because he's not speaking to people, but to God. He is speaking intimate mysteries in the spirit. But when someone prophesies, he speaks to encourage people, to build them up and to bring them comfort. The one who speaks in tongues advances his own spiritual progress while the one who prophesies builds up the church. So family, as you see there, that praying in the spirit is a good thing, number one. But as Apostle Paul says, when you, when you pray in a tongue or when you speak in tongues, it does nothing for the people around you unless someone interprets it. What I want to do this week, though, as he says, when you pray, in, when you speak in tongues or when you pray in the spirit, you're speaking directly to God and you are building up your own self. And that's what I'm asking each and every member to do this week is to for a time every day, pray in the spirit. And I'm going to ask you to pray in the spirit until it happens. What do I mean by that? You know, whenever I pray in the spirit, initially it is like walking in deep snow for me. It is almost a labor. And then suddenly something flips. I don't know what it's called, but something flips. And I am no longer pushing words out, but they're just flowing out. So I'm asking that each and every member pray in the spirit. And so that it happening, it used to take me sometimes 10, 15 minutes before it happened. But the more I practice it, the less time it takes, right? I'm asking that each member pray in the Spirit each day next week until it happens. And then after it happens, just pray for a little while longer. I want us ready to come back together as a body. The last time we met, it was a powerful meeting. And I want this meeting to be as powerful. And I need everyone, everyone on the same page everyone knit together in the spirit and everyone already built up because when we're built up together, the service is so much better. All right, family, we just have two more scriptures. This is concerning how we receive the kingdom, how we, how we make the kingdom manifest. Jesus tells us this, that unless you receive the kingdom, as a little child, have that childlike faith, you will by no means enter the kingdom. And the way I like to, to look at interpret that, that verse is that it is, he's actually saying that the kingdom will by no means enter you. So we have to have simple childlike faith, which says, I believe. That simple childlike faith. I told you the story as how my daughter listened to what I told her and because of what I told her, she was able to endure a painful burn on her finger because of something I told her. 
And she just took my words at face value. Take the words of our Father at face value. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom won't enter you. But God, our Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we would become his righteousness, the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Family, he's taking care of everything that we need so we're not to worry. Second scripture, the law of Moses and the revelation of the prophets have prepared you for the arrival of the kingdom realm. The law of Moses and the revelation of the prophets have prepared you for the arrival of the kingdom realm announced by John. And now, when this wonderful news of God's kingdom realm is preached, people's hearts burn with extreme passion to press in and receive it. So family, what we learn in that one scripture is that the law and the prophets have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. That was passed away. Jesus came and instituted the kingdom. Why? Because he satisfied all the law and he fulfilled all the prophecies so that you and I could inhabit the kingdom of heaven or so the kingdom of heaven could inhabit us. Family, Governor Northam is about to lift the restrictions. It's time for the church to go back to work. It's time for us to be the church. It's time for us to carry everything that we know and everything that we have experienced in this, this wonderful Holy Spirit who's breathed life into us, to carry that out into the world. It's time, family. As Sister Sherry sang in, in her, I believe it was her second song, now is the time. Family, now is the time. Let's go. Oh, don't go anywhere. It's time for communion. All right, family, now it's time for communion, where we partake of the body and the blood of Christ, just as he commanded. In John 6, he said this, unless we do this, we will not or do not have life in us. So we do this to show both our unity with him, as well as to receive the benefits of his sacrifice in his body and the gift of righteousness in his blood. So Cutie is going to read the scriptures and then we'll have communion. 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So family, we do this proclaiming the death of the Lord, the death of the Lord. See, when the Lord died, the old you died. When the Lord died, the caterpillar that was you became a butterfly. Wow. So let's bless these elements. Father, we thank you for this body and this blood. Your word says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement necessary for us to have peace was upon him and by the stripes he received we were healed and we thank you for his blood. Your word says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission. And Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ is far greater than the blood of bulls and goats. And because of that blood, we now stand as your righteousness in Christ. So Father, we receive both the body and the blood. We do this all for the, or for the honor and for the glory of one name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, family. Amen. Amen. Take, eat, and drink.
All right, family. That was today's service. I absolutely love and adore each and every one of you. We can't wait to see you all back here next week. And if you stay tuned, Cutie and I are going to race to the other day. And she has no way of catching me. I am the fastest person. Actually, no, we're not running anywhere. I'm running upstairs. <laughs> I love you. But more importantly, Jesus loves you. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, that Word took on flesh and dwelt among us. My brothers and sisters, I commend you to God our Father and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are the sanctified. sanctified. Have a beautiful day, family. We'll see you here tomorrow for five minutes of encouragement where we learn how to torment the devil. Mm. See you tomorrow.